Hello. My name is Dr. Rich Brown. I'm a professor of family medicine at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and director of WIFL, the Wisconsin Initiative to Promote Healthy Lifestyles. Thanks for joining me today for this educational presentation on integrating alcohol and drug screening and intervention into the routine care of patients with bipolar disorder. This presentation is intended to help you improve bipolar disease outcomes for your patients by delivering systematic alcohol and drug screening and intervention. By way of disclosure, I must mention that I own and serve as CEO of Wellsys, a company which enables healthcare settings to deliver tobacco, alcohol, drug, and depression screening and intervention. After this presentation, I hope you'll be able to explain the rationale for screening all your patients with bipolar disease for alcohol and drug use. You should be able to describe a continuum of substance use with various categories that dictate appropriate clinical management. I hope you'll be able to delineate evidence-based approaches to screening, assessment, intervention, and referral to treatment for alcohol and drug issues. And I hope you'll be able to discuss options for systematically delivering these services in busy clinical settings. First, let's focus on why all patients with bipolar disease ought to be screened for their drinking and drug use. One reason to screen is that substance use disorders are quite common among patients with bipolar disease. This slide shows the comorbidity between substance use disorders and various mental health disorders, and you can see that comorbidity is highest with types 1 and 2 bipolar disease. Another reason to screen is that substance use disorders can exert many negative impacts on patients with bipolar disease. It can aggravate many of the symptoms, it can contribute to more aggressive and violent behaviors, it can lead to higher and more expensive healthcare utilization, and it can result in less adherence with treatment and worse treatment outcomes. Another reason to screen for substance use disorders among these patients is that these substance use disorders shorten lifespans. This slide depicts the results of a large population study that focused separately on males and females. You can see that those individuals without substance use disorders live the longest. Those individuals with alcohol use disorders suffered shorter lifespans and individuals with the shortest lifespans had drug use disorders. So it's imperative that we proactively seek to identify substance use disorders among these patients and intervene accordingly. Of course, it wouldn't make sense to screen unless we could make a difference in people's outcomes. And here are the typical treatment goals we have in mind when we're treating bipolar disease. We want to reduce symptoms. We want to improve psychosocial functioning. We want to prevent relapse, and we want to help patients achieve their life goals. And usually, all of these goals can be better addressed if we can recognize and better intervene or treat for risky or problem substance use. For a general population, there's ample research demonstrating that brief interventions, when delivered for patients with risky and problem but not dependent substance use, can make a difference in drinking, emergency department visits, hospital admissions, injuries, arrests, and car crashes. There's every reason to believe that these benefits would carry over to patients with bipolar disorder. We also know that brief interventions reduce health care costs. One randomized controlled trial conducted in Wisconsin primary care settings found nearly $1,000 in net savings over the next year. Most of those savings accrued because of reductions in emergency department visits and hospitalizations, and those savings persisted at least through four years. Another study was conducted in emergency departments and trauma centers on patients who were there for alcohol-related injuries. Those who received brief interventions manifested more than a 45% reduction in repeat alcohol-related injuries over the next year. And in both studies, we saved about $4 in the next year for every dollar we initially spent providing services. A third study was conducted at Washington State Emergency Departments and focused particularly on dual eligible patients, those covered by Medicare and Medicaid. That study showed more than a $4,000 reduction in health care costs per patient over the next year. So brief interventions can not only improve patient health outcomes, but also reduce health care costs. 
The United States Preventive Services Task Force recommends that all patients receive alcohol screening and intervention in primary care settings. Since 1996, the United States Preventive Services Task Force has recommended that all primary care patients undergo alcohol screening and, if appropriate, intervention. This task force recommends about 25 preventive services for individuals of various age and gender groups. The National Commission on Prevention Priorities was asked to rank preventive services in two ways. One is how much disease, injury, and death would be prevented if each service were actually delivered to the appropriate patients. They also assessed how much money could be saved if appropriate patients got the services. You can see the number one service was recommending daily aspirin for patients at risk for heart attack and stroke. This received the highest rating for preventable burden and return on investment. Number two was childhood immunizations. Numbers three and four were tobacco and alcohol screening and intervention. Those services were ranked higher than many other services that we've come to expect in primary care settings. Indeed, if we are going to screen patients for high blood pressure, cholesterol, and many cancers, it only makes sense to administer routine tobacco and alcohol screening and intervention as well. Here's just a small group of national and statewide organizations that recommend that all patients get alcohol screening and intervention. The National Business Group on Health represents employers. Employers are implored to make sure that their payers reimburse for these services and that their providers deliver these services. The Office of National Drug Control Policy is better known as the Drug Czar's Office, as these kinds of services can also be useful for various illicit drugs and misuse of potentially addictive prescription drugs. Two groups of employers, represented by the Business Healthcare Group and the Alliance, recommend that patients in Wisconsin receive these services. And you can see that other business interests represented by Wisconsin manufacturers and commerce agree. The services are also supported by the Wisconsin Medical Society and the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association, the umbrella organization for Wisconsin's federally qualified health centers. You can see there is a continuum of drinking all the way from abstinence to heavy drinking. You can see that the more someone drinks, the more risks they have, and eventually the more numerous and severe consequences they accumulate. High risk drinking is defined in terms of standard drinks. It turns out that 12 ounces of beer has the same amount of alcohol as 5 ounces of wine or 1.5 ounces of 80-proof liquor, such as typical vodka or whiskey. The National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism has reviewed literally hundreds of studies to identify how much alcohol starts to put individuals at risk for health and social consequences of their drinking. You can see that when men drink more than 14 drinks in a week, or more than four drinks on any particular occasion, we start to see higher risk for those health and social consequences. When women drink more than seven drinks per week, or more than three per occasion, we start to see elevated risk. The numbers are lower for women because they tend to weigh less, they tend to have proportionately less water weight in their bodies, and they tend to absorb alcohol more completely and quickly from their stomachs. You can see that when frail elderly patients have more than even one drink on an occasion, they may be at increased risk for problems with memory and falls. So that defines high-risk drinking. It's important to remember that all drug use is considered high-risk. For one thing, use of illicit drugs and misuse of prescription drugs more frequently lead to addiction than alcohol use. Some people wonder whether this is true for marijuana, but it clearly is. Marijuana is at least twice as potent as it was 30 years ago. It is the drug that most frequently brings individuals for drug treatment. It also has clear negative effects on memory and learning, much more than we used to think. And we now know that it is indeed a risk factor for lung cancer uh, because it does involve smoking unfiltered material. Farther on the continuum, individuals are suffering negative consequences of their drinking and drug use. Generally, the more people drink or use, the more numerous and severe consequences they suffer.
Here are the typical categories in which individuals who drink excessively or use drugs tend to suffer. There are clearly many biomedical consequences. Injuries can occur even with one episode of risky drinking or drug use. Other biomedical consequences may occur just in time. Mental health symptoms can occur early on in an alcohol or drug problem. They may involve full-fledged depression, anxiety, or psychotic syndromes but they are usually just involving particular symptoms, as when people are not quite themselves, perhaps a little more sad, anxious, or angry than typical. Those mental health symptoms often translate into strain in family relationships and relationships with other friends. There may be difficulty at work or school. There may be financial strain as individuals spend more on alcohol or drug use than they can afford. There obviously may be legal problems, and for individuals for whom religion or spirituality is important, there may be difficulties in those realms. Now let's look at another aspect of the continuum, dependent symptoms. One symptom of alcohol or drug dependence may be physical dependence. Physical dependence occurs when an individual drinks or uses drugs sufficiently that when they suddenly quit or cut down, they suffer withdrawal symptoms. The most dangerous drugs to withdraw from are actually alcohol and other sedatives. You'll notice the plus minus sign before the words physical dependence. That's because individuals who are addicted to alcohol or other drugs may or may not be physically dependent. We now know that physical dependence occurs in a different part of the brain from where true addiction occurs. And that's why physical dependence is set off in the lower part of this slide. The top of the slide shows true symptoms of dependence or addiction. One symptom may be preoccupation, when individuals have a hard time not thinking about drinking or drug use. Another symptom is compulsive use, when a little bit of alcohol or drug use inevitably leads to more use. There may also be urges and cravings in individuals with dependence. All of these symptoms lead to the most important symptom of dependence, loss of control. Try as individuals might, and many try very hard, they cannot consistently stay quit or cut down. That is the primary symptom of alcohol or drug dependence. We now know that addiction is truly a brain disease. It involves a hijacking of the pleasure reward system of the brain. Nature gave humans and all animals this system to drive survival and procreation. It's this system that makes us feel good when we've had a nice meal or when we have sex. With addiction, this system is hijacked. So rather than driving eating and sexual behaviors, it drives drinking and drug use. The number one risk factor for addiction is determined by genetics, but there are also environmental factors at play as well. This slide will show three PET scans of individuals who are or are not addicted to methamphetamine. We would see the same PET scans in individuals who are addicted to other substances, including alcohol. This first slide shows the PET scan of a pleasure reward center for an individual who is not addicted. The red area shows the greatest amount of nerve conduction, the amount that's necessary for a normal pleasure reward system to tell the rest of the brain that life is okay. The second PET scan shows a pleasure reward system of an individual who is addicted to methamphetamine but has not used any meth for a month. The meth is long gone from the brain and the bloodstream. This is a pleasure reward system that is screaming to the rest of the brain that something feels very wrong, that this individual is miserable, and the only way to feel more normal is to use meth again. This is what's responsible for the urges and cravings, the compulsive use, and the preoccupation of addiction. The third PET scan shows the same individual two years later after two years of abstinence from methamphetamine. You can see that the red is coming back, the brain is healed, and the urges and cravings now are much reduced, and it's easier for the individual to stay clean and sober. These PET scans show 
that addiction, including alcoholism, is clearly a disease of the brain, a physiologic dysfunction of the pleasure reward system. The good news is that when people stay clean and sober, often with help from treatment, we can help the brain heal and make it easier for individuals to live without their substances. Since addiction is clearly a disease of the brain, and since the number one risk factor for addiction is genetics, we should take special care to show compassion to patients with addiction rather than judge them harshly. It's very important to identify where each patient lies on this continuum of substance use because their category of substance use dictates appropriate clinical management. Patients with dependent symptoms should be referred for treatment. Those in a middle range of mild to moderate risk or problems can respond to brief interventions delivered right there in the general healthcare setting. Next, we'll talk about alcohol and drug screening and brief assessment. We start off with a simple alcohol screening question. For men, we ask, when is the last time you had more than four standard drinks? For women, three standard drinks. Any response within the last three months is considered a positive screen. In screening for drug use, another single item screen is recommended. How many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or used a prescription medication for non-medical reasons? You can see that this question is quite sensitive and specific for drug use and related disorders. If the screen is negative, we want to reinforce good, healthy, low-risk drinking behaviors. For example, we might let patients know that one or two drinks a day for a man or one drink a day for a woman reduces the risk of heart disease and stroke, but more than that is actually unhealthy. And we want to commend patients for drinking in a healthy range. A positive screen suggests that a patient may have risk or problems. They may be high-risk drinkers or drug users, or they may have negative consequences of their substance use, or they may be dependent. Once a patient screens positive, it's important that we conduct further assessment to determine which part of the continuum they lie on. This slide shows how assessment is important in guiding clinical service delivery. Patients at low risk receive reinforcement for their healthy, safe behaviors. Patients in a middle range of high risk substance use. Patients with high risk substance use or problem substance use should receive brief interventions, and those who are dependent should be referred for expert assessment and likely treatment. There are two ways of conducting assessment. One way involves a clinical interview, and we'll talk about that first. In a clinical interview, we first attempt to discern whether a patient is suffering negative consequences of their drinking or drug use. Remember that those consequences can occur in these eight different realms. Initially, we attempt to identify whether a patient is suffering negative consequences of their drinking or drug use. Remember, these are the eight realms in which people suffer those consequences. And we also identify whether patients are suffering symptoms of dependence. Conducting this kind of interview is a combination of art and science of communication skills. Unfortunately, we don't have time in this educational program to go into depth about how to conduct a clinical interview. The questionnaire that's used most widely is called the audit, or the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. This test includes 10 items or questions, three which focus on the quantity and frequency of alcohol use, three on symptoms of dependence, and four on negative consequences. Here's a summary of the focuses of those 10 items of the audit. You can see that these questions focus on a wide range of uh, behaviors and consequences and symptoms around alcohol use. The audit is quite easy to score. Each item is a multiple choice question and each response can earn zero to four points. You simply add up the points for the questions and that guides the interpretation. Zero to seven points puts a patient in the low risk category, and we want to reinforce those low risk healthy drinking behaviors. Eight to 19 points puts the patient in the middle range where they would benefit from a brief intervention. And 20 points or more 
indicates possible alcohol dependence and referral for assessment. For drug assessment, the most commonly used questionnaire is called the DAST-10, where DAST stands for Drug Abuse Screening Test. There are 10 yes-no items that focus on various aspects of drug use, consequences, and dependent symptoms. It's also important to ask patients what drugs they're using, how frequently they're using them, and whether they are engaged in injection drug use. For the DAS-10 itself, we allot one point for each yes response, and we add them up. One or two yes responses indicates a low level of risk or problem. Intervention should follow. Three to five points indicates more moderate problems. Intervention and follow-up are recommended. Six to 10 points suggest a more substantial problem and referral for specialized assessment and possibly treatment would be best. It's also important that regardless of a patient's DAS score, we refer them for specialty-based assessment for any injection use and for daily use of any substance. Our initial recommendation on drug use depends on the DAS score. For DAS score six or greater, or for any daily use or injection use, again, referral is indicated. For a DAS score of one to five, if there's no daily use and no injection use, a recommendation of abstinence can be issued in a general medical setting. Next, we'll talk about how to deliver alcohol and drug interventions and referrals. In general, we can use the same steps whether we're delivering interventions or referrals. You can remember the steps by the FERNS mnemonic. Feedback, education, recommendation, negotiation, and set plan. Here is a simple recipe for delivering initial feedback. First, we can list possible substance-related consequences without mentioning substance abuse per se. So we may simply just deliver a list of the negative consequences or stresses in a patient's life that emanate from their substance use. Next, we can express concern that substance use may be contributing to these stresses. And the third step is to ask the patient what they think. Do they agree that these stresses are being caused by or at least contributed to by their substance use? When we deliver this feedback, it's best to avoid unilateral diagnostic pronouncements. It's best to avoid pejorative labels. Our goal is to avoid arguments with patients and to elicit discussion. After all, it's less important what we think about the patient's substance use. It's more important to get patients to think about their substance use, whether it's causing any difficulties and whether they might wish to change. In many instances, it's helpful to conduct some education on how substance use can be causing stresses or negative consequences in a patient's life. So we might explain why we are concerned. We might explain, for example, how alcohol, although it helps some patients get to sleep more quickly, it can actually hinder deep sleep and cause fatigue the next day. In general, when conducting education, it's important to ask initially about a patient's initial perception. Then we might ask the patient's permission to share our perception. It's important that we deliver these educational messages briefly and in terms that are familiar to the patient. After we're done, it's important to ask for the patient's reaction. What do they think of what we've said? And perhaps even more importantly, do they think this message has some relevance in their lives? When we conduct education in this way, we help patients put two and two together and hopefully understand how their substance use may be contributing to problems in their lives, and perhaps we will help them find motivation to make a change. The initial recommendation we make depends largely on the audit score. If the audit is 20 or greater, our initial recommendation should be referral for specialty-based assessment and possibly treatment. If the audit score falls between 8 and 19, there are some other information we should gather. Has the patient had alcohol treatment in the past? Does alcohol dependence tend to run in the family? Does the patient have certain alcohol-sensitive medical conditions? Or do they take certain medications which are unsafe to take with alcohol? 
If the answer to any of those questions is yes, it's best to recommend abstinence. If the answer to those questions is no, then we can recommend those low-risk, safe drinking cutoffs. No more than 14 per week or four in an occasion for men, and no more than seven per week or three in an occasion for women. And if the audit score is less than eight, then we can reinforce good healthy drinking. This slide shows how to interpret the DAS-10. If the DAS-10 score is greater than or equal to six, or if in response to other questions, the patient admits to daily use or to injection drug use, then there clearly should be a referral made. If the DAS score is less than that, if there's no daily use and no injection use, then we can simply make a recommendation of abstinence. If a patient is unwilling to stick to those low-risk drinking limits, perhaps they're willing to cut down some. And some patients, of course, will not be ready to change at all. Our job is to accept their decision and perhaps find openings for additional discussion in the future. If the patient is willing to accept a referral, there are several options to consider. Referral for professional treatment is best. When making a referral, we can consider professional and lay options. For professional treatment, there may be several barriers. Financing would be a large barrier. Childcare and transportation barriers may keep otherwise interested patients out of treatment, and perhaps we can help find resources for those needs. It's also important that we consider what modalities are available at various referral resources. For example, would a patient do best in groups, one-on-one -on -one treatment, or other options? And is pharmacotherapy available for patients with alcohol or opioid dependence? Examples of lay treatment options include 12-step programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, or Narcotics Anonymous, or another option is Smart Recovery. In general, I prefer to recommend that patients try several different meetings before they decide whether this lay treatment is appropriate and helpful for them. When we deliver brief interventions, it can be helpful to help patients set limits for themselves according to a weekly calendar. We may want to help a patient decide how many days a week they're going to drink, the maximum number of drinks they'll have per day, and the maximum number of drinks they'll consume in a week. So for example, this slide depicts a patient who decided to limit his drinking to no more than four drinks on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and no more than one drink on a Tuesday and Thursday, so they keep to that limit of 14 drinks for healthier and safer drinking. We can also help patients identify triggers in their lives, factors that they may need to avoid or manage so that they don't exceed these limits. We can also help patients identify features in their environments that they may need to avoid or manage to avoid drinking more than they set out to. When we're helping patients set a plan, we always want to invite follow-up. It's nice if the follow-up can occur face-to-face, -face, but if not, a phone call may be useful. This slide shows some of the issues we like to cover during follow-up visits. One question is, to what degree the patient is implementing their change plan. If they are implementing it well, terrific. If not, have they lost some motivation to change? If they are implementing the plan, have they recognized a need to modify the plan to make it more effective? Sometimes a patient is sticking well to their change plan, but not experiencing the benefits they forecasted. For example, if a patient decides to cut down on his drinking, to help himself feel better the next morning, is the patient actually feeling better rested that next morning? Perhaps they need to reduce their drinking targets further. Often when patients initiate a change plan, it's a good challenge for them to identify whether they are able to control their drinking. Sometimes only by implementing a change plan do patients realize that they lack some control over their drinking and drug use and perhaps that's the first suggestion that they are suffering from alcohol or drug dependence. Those patients might do well with a referral 
to determine whether they truly are alcohol and drug dependent, and if so, treatment is the best course. So we've talked about why it's important to screen patients with bipolar disease for substance use. We talked about the importance of identifying where patients lie on the continuum, how to do so through screening and assessment, and we've talked about delivering interventions and referrals. Now let's talk about ways that we can integrate these services into busy clinical settings. One challenge that clinicians face is how to bring up this sensitive issue. This slide suggests a couple of ways. One is to introduce this topic by letting patients know that we ask all of our patients some important questions about prevention. For patients with bipolar disease, we can let them know that alcohol and drugs can aggravate their bipolar disease, so we'd like to ask them some questions and seek their permission to do so. A nice initial question about alcohol is just a yes-no question. Do you drink alcohol? If yes, we can launch into our screening questions. We can use a slightly different question to break the ice about drug use. Patients are understandably a little reluctant to admit to current drug use. We can introduce the topic with an initial question on whether a patient has ever experimented with any drugs. If so, then we can launch into questions uh, on more recent drug use. At this point, I'm sure many of you are thinking these would be wonderful, worthwhile services to deliver, but do you possibly have the time to do all of this? If not, then here's where we get back to discussing the Wisconsin Initiative to Promote Healthy Lifestyle and WIFL's model of integrating alcohol screening and intervention into busy clinical practices. In WIFL clinics, typically patients complete a screen while they're in the waiting room. The receptionist hands them the screen and asks them to complete it before they see their providers. Typically, the medical assistant who checks vital signs reviews the written screen, and if the alcohol screening question is positive, then the medical assistant refers that patient to an on-site health educator who sees the patient preferably at that visit and delivers all appropriate assessment, intervention, and referral services. As you know, many experts recommend that we adopt a team approach so that we can actually deliver all of the preventive and chronic illness services that patients require. In hospital settings and emergency departments, it's even easier. Health educators can simply introduce themselves to patients, start the screening, and deliver all appropriate services. WIFL has implemented this model in 31 clinical sites around Wisconsin. With our help, those clinics have screened over 117,000 patients and delivered over 26,000 interventions. Patients have indicated high satisfaction with the services. We've helped patients decrease their binge drinking by 20%. Plus, we substantially decreased regular marijuana use and depression symptoms. Advantages of this model is that it can help your primary care setting meet many NCQA criteria for patient-centered medical homes. This model will also help you address three quality measures if you are a Medicare Accountable Care Organization. These services would generate healthcare cost savings for those ACOs. Also, this model would help systematically address Joint Commission quality measures on tobacco and alcohol screening and intervention. And of course, most of us are still working on a fee-for-service basis, and the reimbursement available in Wisconsin through Medicaid and many commercial payers can help you generate a small profit by delivering these services. So in summary, I hope you're convinced that it's important to screen for alcohol and drug use among your patients with bipolar disease. Alcohol and drug use and related disorders are quite common among these patients who often suffer harm from their drinking and drug use. Therefore, all patients should be screened, and depending on assessment results, uh, patients should receive intervention or referral. The process can be efficient if patients complete screens and assessments in writing. Of course, interventions, referrals, and follow-up can take time. If you don't have that time, I hope you'll consider adding a health educator to your healthcare team, as WIFL has shown successful in many clinics around Wisconsin. Well, thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this presentation.
If you have any other questions about this material, feel free to go to the WIFL website, wiphl.org, and also feel free to contact me directly at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health.